Welcome to <coughs> chapter eight of soil science and management. Today we're going to talk about water and water conservation and how that plays a role in soil science. So uh, today's objectives are understanding fresh water supplies, understanding the need for water conservation, uh, and understanding better ways to use water, and then understanding how water quality can play a factor in uh, dealing with uh, your soils. To start, just a quick overview of the hydrologic cycle, also known sometimes as the water cycle, is basically, uh, you know, water condensates, water um, evaporates, and water precipitates. So you have the ocean, you have water that evaporates out of the ocean, condensates into clouds, and then precipitates back onto the earth, in forms rivers, lakes, streams, uh, and in many areas, especially in Southern California, groundwater. 97% uh, of all the water in the on the earth is is in the in the ocean, and this is all water that we cannot use. So this is all water that is unavailable for plants and uh, animals to um, uh, uh, to use for for living. Uh, we do have to have processes to remove the salts from this to make it operational for, for a human or a plant. The, uh, the hydrologic cycle is something that is um, powered by the sun, and the heat from the sun is what uh, allows that water to evaporate, and then um, the cold allows it to con condensate. And then the cycle is just a perpetual cycle that continues and continues and continues. So what we have here in America, we do have um, freshwater sources and we have groundwater sources. <clears throat> California has um, some of the best groundwater aquifers uh, with available water. Uh, where I live, <clears throat> we have a huge underwater aquifer that we rely on 100% for our for our uh, our tap water. There is no uh, no surface water near us. We do take water from Northern California through the California Aqueduct. And if you think about it, there aren't many uh, freshwater lakes that are uh, utilized in Southern California. There is Lake Paris, there's Lake Elsinore, there are other smaller lakes, but most of those lakes are man-made lakes and they are used strictly as reservoirs to hold water until it is needed. Uh, most of the climates we have uh, in California are uh, arid or semi-arid. There are humid climates, but they are rare. Those are mostly are seen further east in the United States. Uh, Menifee area would be considered an arid or in between semi-arid and arid. It's not quite a desert, but it's not quite uh, uh, any other, it's not quite to semi-arid climates. It's still very dry Mediterranean style climate with uh, most of its rainfall falling in the winter time. <clears throat> so, when we look at uh, the water resources in the United States, there are many reasons for water conservation. Um, there is water that is available, but as we grow in population, we are utilizing more of that water for um, agricultural purposes and for urban purposes. And uh, as that water is returned, it is returned dirtier, so we want to make sure we're only using that correct amount of water and we're not overdoing the amount of water for say agriculture because <clears throat> if we are then we're polluting a larger amount of water or we are wasting a larger amount of water because it may move and uh, travel to a different region. Um, there are worldwide shortages and this is obviously not a, a water shortage but this is a fresh water shortage we are uh, slowly adopting desalination, but it's not coming fast enough. And a lot of the current freshwater sources that we have are drying up. And uh, this can be seen if you ever looked at the, the Ural Sea in, in, uh, in uh, Russia. It's basically about a quarter of what it used to be. And this was the largest freshwater body in the entire world. So there are quite a bit of uh, 
worldwide water shortages where people are not having access to clean, fresh drinking water. Um, you can, if you're doing water conservation correctly, you can actually um, increase your yields and have better soil. And this is because when you're using only what is needed, then the soil doesn't have to work to repel all the extra water and it can hold on to what it needs and the plants don't have to work um, harder when there's too much water in the soil. So conserving water can be important for plants as well. When we're reducing the runoff, uh, like I said earlier, <clears throat> we are improving water quality. We are also reducing erosion and we're not going to lose the topsoils or other uh, uh, fertilizers and materials that we're paying to put on our, our soils to help grow plants. Um, and when we look at water use efficiency, this is something we look at called consumptive use. And um, when you put a certain amount of, of soil, or excuse me, of water on the soil, only um, a certain percentage of that is useful. For example, if you were to look at like natural precipitation or rain, approximately 25% of whatever falls is useful. So if you receive an inch of rain, you're not truly getting an inch of water returned into your soil, you're getting approximately 0.25 inches back into your soil that you can be utilized by plants or other um, other animals. When we're looking at consumptive use in uh, uh, artificial, with artificial irrigation, it, it's, it holds a similar um, calculation, but it's, it is greater because when we are irrigating, we're able to manage and um, put out the irrigation water when we want it, as opposed to the gluts that come in a natural setting. <clears throat> Something important that we want to do when we're thinking about um, water in, um, in an agricultural or landscape setting is capturing that water in the soil and allowing it to stay within the uh, usable root zone of the plants. Um, something we, sh we can do when we're capturing runoff is to um, terrace our, our fields. This allows that water to sit on a flat surface longer as opposed to running off a hillside or a slope. And these terraces can um, allow that water to have longer time to infiltrate and, and get into the ground. When we are uh, using a tiller or a, a road, you know, tilling our fields just so to allow that water to be used by the plants, we're going to be able to capture more of that water because we're going to be able to contour the soil to create little pockets so the water stays where we want it to stay. Uh, when we're when we're actually looking at getting the water into the ground, there are certain things that we can do to improve the uh, water uptake or water percolation. And these are um, your aeration that's creating artificial holes or channels within the ground to allow that water to, to flow through the ground. We also have mulch, which can hold on to water as it's in the ground and this mulch will allow that water to remain where we want it longer. And uh, again, conservation tillage, this is going to be when we are cons when tilling up the soil before you know, while we are watering to ensure that this water is getting into the part of the root zone that we are hoping for it to get into. Something we do here in California that's very important is uh, capturing snowfall. Uh, in Southern California, we don't really receive a lot of rain. Uh, approximately two thirds of all the rainfall that happens in California comes in the snow during the winter time. And what we want to be able to do is capture that snowfall and allow it to flow into our reservoirs to allow that snow to be able to be used later. Um, fast forwarding to reducing percolation. And what this means is um, reducing the percolation past the root zone of the plants. Uh, something we can put into the soil is a, a gel polymer that will swell uh, when the water <clears throat> hits it and it will save that water within the soil longer 
so it doesn't uh, flow through the root zone of those plants. Uh, this can, if you've ever uh, worked with baby diapers or seen the material that's in a baby diaper, that is the same uh, gelled polymers that are used and can hold water within the root zone longer to allow plants to access that water later. And then uh, reducing that consumptive use, and this goes back into um, irrigation water efficiency, is to, if we're reducing our evaporation and our transpiration, uh, using just the right amount of waters and replacing only that water that's lost to the plant, we're consumptively using that water more efficiently and we're not going to be applying water that we don't need to apply. Um, so when we're looking at urban areas, uh, most lawns actually shed water um, on their own. <clears throat> this has to do with when homes are built within urban areas, unfortunately, a lot of the materials are put into the soil and uh, that soil is not a, a very strong or great soil to be growing uh, grasses or trees because of the materials that can be put into there. And those soils don't hold on to water very well. So many soils in these urban areas or residential areas need to be amended pretty heavily to uh, allow water to be held in the uh, in the soil to be used um, when we also are just speaking of urban areas we see a lot of runoff because we have a lot of hardscapes concretes asphalts uh, patios rooftops we have we actually are removing a lot of the surface area where water can be infiltrated back into the uh, water table because we're just adding a whole lot of hardscapes hard areas where water is not able to infiltrate and this reduces the, the surface area for water to uh, be captured. And then our groundwater levels can be impacted due to the lack of, of surface area. Um, something that can be done here in, in Southern California that's very important is uh, we have lots of grasses and shrubs and, and flowers. And we wanna make sure we're taking out those or planting only those that are adapted to a drier climate. As I stated earlier, this being a Mediterranean climate, not many plants are adapted to that. And if we do plant those that are adapted to this, then we are able to uh, uh, allow those plants to naturally be irrigated by the natural rainfalls that happen during the wintertime. Many of the plants, if we allow them to go back to a natural state, will accept water one time a year and they will learn to conserve it throughout the whole year. But we have to work with them and train plants to, uh, to act like that. Uh, something that is becoming a very big uh, issue and commodity here within Southern California and, and actually the entire world is utilizing reclaimed water. And, and reclaimed water is any water that is um, sent into a sewer system and cleaned, filtered uh, chemicals are used to make sure that this is safe. And then this can be used to offset a potable water source throughout the uh, throughout an area. So potable water would be that water that's suitable to drink. This reclaimed water is not suitable to drink, but what we can do is clean it up and uh, use it on a golf course or a park, or uh, there are new home housing developments that are being um, built with special irrigation lines that uh, are dual metering homes. So they are, um, all the outdoor watering is being done using reclaimed water and the indoor watering is used, uh, indoor uh, water uses is, is through potable water. Uh, water quality is super important when it comes to working with soils. Luckily in California, we have generally great water quality there are a few constituents that we deal with that are, can affect us as we are drinking the water, such as arsenic or chromium-6. Uh, there's some new ones that are being looked into, but uh, in general, water quality is good here. We do have to be very cognizant of our nitrate loading. Uh, this can be an issue in agricultural communities because with this nitrate, we uh, can increase um, uh, problems in treating this water, as well as creating issues of algae growth in lakes or rivers. Um, 
we have to make sure that when we're fertilizing, we're only using the fertilizer that is uh, the amount we need, and we don't want to go extra. Uh, kind of like uh, a little bit is good, so a lot is better. It doesn't really work in pesticide use or fertilizer use, so we have to be very careful not to allow those extra chemicals into our environment. Um, as I said, here's a couple ways to avoid, you know, over polluting your water and it's reducing runoff, reducing erosion, reducing fertilizer losses that leave a property, uh, make sure, making sure you're storing and applying manure properly, uh, making sure that we're maintaining wetlands and not letting, allowing them to dry, uh, practicing uh, drainage management, and then installing conservation buffers. So um, all of these can help water quality because if we are making sure that the water is either going where we want it to go or not picking up things we don't want it to pick up or keeping it where it should be is going to be a strong way to help keep the water quality the way it is and not increase the water quality, <laughs> not increase the constituents within the water that will degrade the water quality. So in summary, uh, this chapter, we went over water conservation, where uh, fresh water comes from, what uses water and um, how we can um, improve water use and then some of those pollution concerns. This topic is uh, pretty important to me. This is what I'm doing uh, day to day is understanding water conservation and how it affects um, us as humans, but also plants. My background was growing plants and, and making sure we're saving water. And, and then today I'm ensuring that we're only using the correct amount of water within our homes. So if there's any questions, then by all means, this is a great topic uh, for you to ask, and I would be more than happy to answer any of them. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed this, and uh, see you next time.